We are so delighted and fortunate to have Venerable Tenzin Choki with us tonight at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, yeah, I just, I, I spoke last Friday um, to a group a bit about spiritual friendship and uh, looking out at these screens, at these boxes of people, I see so many spiritual friends and I'm, I'm feeling so delighted um, and really wanted to highlight, you know, the benefit of spiritual friendship at this time and in all times that we're really here for each other to show up honestly and to really be able to progress our practice together. Um, tonight we're going to do something we haven't done uh, since the pandemic started. Those of you who sat with me at San Francisco Dharma Collective know that I was notorious for putting, putting people in small groups whether they liked it or signed up for it or not. I've been a little hesitant in the online format. I wanted to really allow people to have the space to practice quietly and to receive teachings um, and have that. Um, and Venerable uh, said tonight, let's do breakouts. And I felt like I am ready. I think it's a good time for us uh, to have some structured format of reflection and really develop that spiritual friendship. One thing I just wanna highlight when we think about spiritual friendship is uh, your spiritual friends, here's a list of things they don't do. They don't fix things for you. They don't try to tell you it's okay, it's gonna get better. They are, um, you know, really listening with an open heart without needing to change anything. And the value of spiritual friendship, or one of the many values of spiritual friendship, is we're allowed to bear our hearts without having to worry about, you know, someone telling us that we should feel better soon or that we need to do something else to not feel that way. It's we get to be witnessed in our fullness. Um, so I, I caveat that with also saying spiritual friends in an online mediated platform, we can't just bear all of our heart per se. Um, if there are things that are really going on for us that maybe are bigger than can be held in this space currently. So on the one hand, I'm asking you as spiritual friends to show up and exercise vulnerability the vulnerability that leads to transformation because there's a real honest seeing of ourselves. And I invite you to just keep in mind that all of us are tired and inspired, grateful and grumpy, doing our best here. So when it comes to sharing, really take an empathic approach to what someone else can really hold for you. So I hope those polarities make sense, right? I'm asking you to show up with your authenticity and be considerate of others in what you're sharing. Um, and I'm going to share now my little paramitas here. Uh, you haven't seen these, Venerable. I'm excited to share these I'm with you. I'm excited to see them. I, I was in our first session of this online format thinking of what are the things that could really help people show up in this mediated platform really with their full self. And I was like, discipline. Patience, I was like, this is familiar. <laughs> so many of you know these quite well. These are uh, some of the spiritual qualities that really support us along the path. And here I'm inviting us to consider how can we use them specifically in a way in our, in our container together. Uh, so in our container together, I, I invite you to consider the discipline of really considering, bearing in mind throughout this time together, this ethos of non-harming to yourself and to others. So in the way that you are texting, in the way that you're communicating, in the way that you're thinking towards yourself, um, to be really kind and to be generous, which then leads us to generosity. I really invite you to make a choice, right? My, 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 my their choice here is decide to fully show up and participate or decide to kind of halfway in, halfway out but go for it either way. I understand that many of us have really long days and that we might wanna tune in and hear a little while we're doing other things. And if that's where you're at, we can meet you there. But if you are here and can show up fully, then do so for the full amount of time. And with that, I invite you to keep your camera on. If you're tired of looking at a screen, you can totally just turn your head and, and look in profile view so you can look out over something that isn't, um, uh, the screen that you've maybe been seeing all day, but really give yourself fully to being here with us. That's my invitation for you all. And patience, 
this format is awkward. I almost barely didn't make it on this call, for example. <laughs> I couldn't get my computer to restart. Um, and, you know, there may be some things um, that are a bit challenging as we try to go into breakout groups and come back. And so to really use this as a practice, if we can start really developing our practice of patience, I, I have a feeling that everything in life will become so much more enjoyable. And then lastly, and most importantly, joyful enthusiasm. Um, I do feel as though Venerable Tenzin might be one of the most amazing ambassadors of joyful enthusiasm I've ever known. Um, practicing with her and learning about practice through her, it has always it filled me with that kind of feeling. So I think tonight that'll be easy for us to really enjoy ourselves here. It's serious, it's important work we're doing, and really, let's bring our full sense of joy and enthusiasm together. So that's my only, my only slide I'll share with you, luckily. Um, so yeah, um, one more time, welcome to all of you. If, if you wouldn't mind, even if you're gonna turn your camera off later, I just like to take a moment for all of us to gaze upon one another as spiritual friends and say welcome, hello, hi everyone. So nice to see you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, lovely. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and get going and actually I'm gonna give, um, often we, we start with a sit, but I'm gonna give actually a little background on our topic tonight and then uh, Venerable will lead us in a sit and an engaged practice together. Is that right, Venerable? Do I have that order right? Oh, let's unmute you. No? Can you? There we go. Uh -huh. Oh. Yeah, so I thought um, we could settle, and then you could talk, and then I could talk, and then we'll do a longer meditation about practice at Great. kind of near, right before the breakout groups. Great. So do you want to lead us settling? Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me briefly introduce Venerable Tenzin Shoki. A uh, spiritual friend who I'm so fortunate is part of our Cultivating Emotional Balance teacher training. Um, she is also a, um, a leading teacher of the Compassion Cultivation training. She resides at the Land of Medicine Buddha, which is almost like a pure land. It's a beautiful retreat center in SoCal, California, and has been teaching um, Transforming Hearts and Minds for decades. Um, and we are just so fortunate to have you here with us, Venerable. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. So nice to see new friends and some old friends as well from various places. So, yeah, as Eve said, you know, we've been, we've actually been collaborating together for about seven years since I met Eve. She was my teacher of cultivating emotional balance teacher training in Mexico in 2013. And that, you know, the rest is history, at least to us. <laughs> and we just keep deepening our connection and collaboration and friendship, which I value very much. So I appreciate her inviting me here. Um, yeah, so let's just start with a couple of minutes of settling before we launch into our topic, just as a way of arriving. And so <clears throat> just getting in a comfortable position. It's not necessarily our preferred posture to be sitting in front of a computer, but in whatever way we can to get a posture that's both alert and relax. These two qualities are not contradictory. They can be complementary. And so having a nice straight back for the alertness and then your body relaxed around it and just taking a minute to kind of check into your body. See if you're holding any tightness or tension, just sweeping your attention through. Checking some areas that we often hold tension, the forehead around the eyes the neck and shoulders, relaxing the belly, and just sweeping your attention all the way down through the body. And then let's round off this initial settling of the body with three deep breaths. So really deep diaphragmatic breath all the way in and all the way out, and this activates the soothing system, helps us 
just arrive. And then just a few moments of settling with the breath. So just trying to fully arrive in our bodies, in this space, in the present moment by using the breath as an anchor and as a focus. So just using the sensations of the breath wherever you can follow those sensations the easiest, sometimes the abdomen or the chest, feeling the lungs expanding and contracting, or maybe even the nostrils, that subtle sensation of the breath going in and out of the nose. So just turning our attention to those physical sensations for a few moments to settle and arrive. And then we always begin traditional Buddhist practice by setting our motivation, setting our intention. So just take a moment to reflect on what brought you here tonight. Maybe you're a regular at this meeting. Maybe there's something about the topic that really drew you here tonight. So just taking a moment to reflect, what was it? What was that impulse that brought you here to this session? And then we always try to add some sort of altruistic motivation for our practice. So just reflecting on that altruistic intention that whatever you learn or experience or share or contemplate this evening will lead to not only an increase in your own happiness, but also be of benefit to all living beings. Thank you. Thank you for getting us here. <laughs> Welcome again, everyone, now that we've actually arrived here. So the topic this evening is letting go. So if you've already done that, you can maybe just, you know, turn off your camera <laughs> and clean your house or- make No, I think we should just give you the mic if you've managed <laughs> to do it. You're in charge now. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, I think like many uh, concepts in Buddhism, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what letting go means and, and what it feels like and what it requires. Um, and there's so many different levels and layers. This was a topic uh, that Venerable said, I really want to teach this. Let's focus on this. Um, and I have both so much desire to uh, teach on it so that I can learn more. Um, and also a lot of feeling of humility. It's incredibly hard. Letting be, yielding, surrendering, that feels um, sometimes possible. So if the words are maybe tripping you up on, on what it means to, to let go, 
you know, I invite you to also explore what is the actual feeling or experience of being with things as they are. <clears throat> In the context of, of this book that we've been following here together, so for those, for, maybe it's your first time, we've been following this book of Sokni Rinpoche, Open Heart, Open Mind, and it's, it's a beautiful walk through uh, a traditional view of how we can apply ourselves to a path for transformation. And in our last chapter that we covered, what he does very masterfully <clears throat> is has us look at how do we let go of this separate self structure? And we begin by really looking at all of the different ways that we construct that separate self. We have a separate self that really feels um, kind of, it's called a precious or self cherishing, one that we really hold tightly to. <clears throat> we have a, a separate self that he calls a kind of a mirror eye, a really simple one, one like you have as a child before you recognize a theory of mind of other people. So this like recognizing I have some kind of felt sensations, I have sensory impressions, this kind of very subtle and simple version of knowing that there is an eye. We have also what he describes to be <clears throat> as called a, a social eye the way that we construct ourselves so that we can be seen through the eyes of others. And there's also a, um, an aspect of that that is quite useful, right? So people can know us as well. And in all of these different layers and, and aspects of, of who we are, we can get stuck. We can get fixed. One thing he says is that it's really important for us to have a sense of I. The idea of completely letting go of anything that is our identity is not useful, not helpful, and, and not really possible for us to function in the world in any kind of organized way. So he says, <clears throat> as we contemplate the enormous variety of factors that must come together to produce a specific sense of self, the residue attached to the various layers of I can spontaneously begin to loosen and then dissolve. We become more willing to let go of the desire to control or block our thoughts, emotions, sensations, and so on, and begin to experience them without pain or guilt, absorbing their passage simply as manifestations of a universe of infinite possibilities. So this idea that if we contemplate these versions of us, these ideas of who we are, and we get to know them intimately. Oh yeah, that's that side of me that shows up when I visit my relatives. Oh yeah, that's the side of me that feels they need to have this tone of voice when they show up at work and this kind of smile, or, right? So we start to see these constructs and we recognize them as constructs, neither bad nor wrong. Some of them are less helpful, <laughs> especially if we've imported them from earlier parts of our life. But we can see them as not us. We can see them as actually, um, you know, these aspects or layers of an identity, whereas who we are is far more fluid, ever-changing. And then at our core, as Sokni Rinpoche tells us over and over and over, is this spark. And within this spark is our clarity, our emptiness and our warmth, mm -hmm. our clarity, our emptiness and our warmth. That is us. All these other layers, somewhat useful, sometimes dysfunctional. And if we see them as that, it's okay. We can work through, we can parse out what's useful. <clears throat> and then what he starts in this next chapter that sets us up so well for letting go is he really starts to try to consider, okay, well, but what's the method? of getting through and cutting through all these layers of I, all these sense of identification that we've accumulated over many years. These are sense of who we are. Um, and so, you know, he says that the way to do this is to really start understanding our own mind and to really deeply examine our own mind. Um, and he says something about the mind I found to be just so beautiful and pithy. He says, in the simplest terms possible, what we call the mind is not a thing, but a perpetually moving event. And I like that. And he says it operates on different levels. He is kind of hearkening back to these different levels of relative and then more expansive. So we have our mind that's on a day-to-day -day basis needing to take care of certain things and get them done. 
And then we have this capacity or possibility to know the mind as this vastness, this spaciousness, and this openness. So I think when I consider, you know, letting go um, in the way that he's talking about, he's really talking about actually investigating the aspects of how we appraise the world that get in the way. So it's okay to notice, for example, that you have um, a very cute kitty on your lap. Everybody <laughs> always enjoys that, or at least I do. Um, and, and it's okay to have our sense of what is occurring um, in a moment to moment basis and recognize that we have thoughts, we have reactions, we have uh, preferences. But when we really want to start letting go of that which gets in the way of us and our true nature, we really have to examine a lot of the appraisals that are automatic in how we respond to the world. So in cultivating emotional balance, we often talk about the way that a timeline of an emotion unfolds is we have this automatic appraisal of the world. We're scanning our environment and then we see an event or we see an experience, or we have a thought and automatically our database of past events, hurt and pain usually, <laughs> um, things that have been disappointing and hard, they rise up to meet this event. And in that moment, we lose our freedom. We lose our ability to see reality as it is. We become fused and we can't let go of that experience. So a lot of the process of letting go happens of course in these broad strokes, really understanding the basic philosophy of why letting go matters. And then we see it show up in these moment to moment experiences letting go of our emotional reactions, letting go of our old stories that infuse themselves into our appraisals so that we only can see the world through the lens of I and me and mine. So that's our real, that's our real hope or approach. And again, the method over and over and over and over, the method is always increasing our awareness by any means possible. Oh, <laughs> that's my, my little intro for us. Um, and all. Just a small, you know, mind blowing. It's a little thing. Introduction to selflessness. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. You're a hard act to follow, Dr. Ekman. <laughs> so, yeah, letting go, you know, there's a little backstory to this topic i think it was all the way back in january maybe which at this point feels like a hundred years ago remember january you guys when like we're still hugging people and meeting our friends i had met with the student and she was talking to me about some hard decisions that she was looking to make in her life and you know we're talking about it and she just goes you know I just, it's hard to make changes because it involves letting go. And then I thought, oh, we should really talk about letting go. At that point, the talk that I kind of came up with was all about how stable everything was. And then if you kind of wanted to let go and make changes, but of course, in the intervening three or four months, it's flipped 180 degrees. Now things we feel sometimes that these things are getting ripped away from us. So it's not even about like letting, oh, letting go of my tight grip. It's like we're forced. You know, so many people are going through so much change. Maybe we've had to move because we can't afford our apartment anymore. Maybe we don't have the job that was such a source of our identity. Maybe certain relationships we have have changed. So it's so interesting when I was thinking about this topic and thinking about when I first suggested it to Eve, which happened to be, I think, February, and I was supposed to come to your center in person, and that was the week of the lockdown, I think. So that never happened. And then, you know, all, all that has come about for all of us. So letting go has taken on a completely new meaning for us, I think, in the last couple of months. And there may have been things in your life that have not that you've really let go or you've been forced to let go that have been kind of ripped away from you so that's really interesting so it's kind of changed the context a little bit 
in the original talk that I had was thinking about when the student talked about letting go, I had just read a book and it's interesting. So you're studying Sophie Rinpoche's book. So he comes from this amazing family. There's five brothers in his family. So his father was uh, one of the most renowned Tibetan Buddhist teachers of the 20th century and had these five sons. Four of them are recognized reincarnate lamas and teachers. One of them's a school teacher, and it always makes me wonder what family reunions are like in that household. I'm sure they're fascinating. So Tsopni Rinpoche's youngest brother is called Mingyu Rinpoche. And a number of years ago, I think it was maybe 2008, he famously kind of basically snuck out of his monastery in the middle of the night to do a wandering retreat for three years. And then he wrote a memoir about his experience. So some of you may not be so familiar with the life of a Tibetan recognized reincarnate Lama, which is like a prince. I mean, his whole life he'd been cared for, dressed in brocade, had attendants make his food. He'd never actually touched money. He'd never actually been alone, like never walked down the street alone, never hailed a cab, never bought food at a restaurant. So he decided that he really wanted to challenge all of that conditioning, right? Because here he was, like Eve was saying, trying to let go of this solid concrete identity. And he really looked around and he saw every aspect of his life was doing nothing but reinforce this very solid concrete identity. So he did this incredibly brave thing, snuck off in the middle of the night, terrified. And one of the things that I love the most about his memoir, which is called In Love with the World, is that he talks about all of his fear and he really talks about letting go. For example, he'd always worn monastic robes since he was like four years old or something. So at a certain point, he buys this cloth like an Indian sadhu, this sort of saffron cloth, the way that Indian sadhus wear. He's not ready to let go of his monastic robes. So what he does is he carries the new outfit around in his backpack for like a couple of weeks. And then he starts slowly by putting it on at night when he's alone in his room until he gets ready after a couple of weeks to actually take off his robes and wear this new outfit. And what I, I mean, it was so mind blowing because it's not, typical for these Tibetan Buddhist masters to talk about their emotion, emotional experience at all, right? Their fear, their anxiety, you never, you never hear it. So it was really kind of mind-blowing that way. And to see how tender and gentle he was with his own process of letting go. Like he would consider letting go of something. He'd think about it. Then he'd take baby steps until he was finally ready to do it. Because I think a lot of times for us, if there's something we feel is a hindrance, we think we just have to do this thing of ripping it out at the roots the minute we realize it, rather than realizing, wow, it's a step-by-step-by-step -step -step process of letting go. The Buddha said, everything's changing all the time anyway. And what causes us a lot of suffering is not being aware of this fact of impermanence. So the more used to impermanence we get, right? Which is something that I think is causing us a lot of suffering right now, because right now a lot is changing in our lives and it might be really hard. We might just be going, whoa, I need some ground under my feet. Too much is changing right? And that's what we grasp onto things to give us ground under our feet. But what the Buddha said was, it's always been an illusion. There's never been anything stable. There's really never been anything that you could count on. And then when things change, as they is the nature of reality, then we freak out, right? Because things are changing. But the more used to this process of constant change, like 
the self, like Eve was quoting, is basically a process. There is no solid, concrete, findable self. It's basically a process with concepts labeled on top of it. What is our identity? Some people have an identity that's very tied to their job and their profession. You know, it's well known often when people retire, they go into big depression just because this whole thing that they've really attached to is part of their identity is gone. Relationships, obviously, physical things. So we're going to look at that in a minute. We're going to do a meditation and I'll prompt you with some things to think about and just check with your own experience being very, very gentle with yourself. Maybe there's something you might be willing to consider, considering letting go of, right? We can start there. Maybe there's something you identify, oh, that's something that I'd like to move in the direction of perhaps letting go or changing. I want to read you something. I found this great uh, quote by Pema Chodron, the American Buddhist nun who I think is very beloved, maybe you're all familiar with her. And along this line, she, there's a quote from one of her teachings. Now she uses a word in her teaching, samsara, which is a Sanskrit word which refers to the cycle of uncontrolled rebirth. In Buddhism, a lot of you may be familiar with this word, that the goal of Buddhism is to get free of this uncontrolled cycle, but it basically refers to unwanted experiences. And she says, we hear a lot about the pain of samsara, and we also hear about liberation, but we don't hear much about how painful it is to go from being completely stuck to becoming unstuck. We are undoing a human pattern. We project onto the world a zillion possibilities of attaining resolution. This pattern keeps us dissatisfied and causes us a lot of suffering. As human beings, not only do we seek resolution, but we also feel that we deserve resolution. However, not only do we not deserve resolution, we suffer from resolution. We deserve something better than that, which is the middle way, an open state of mind that can relax with paradox and ambiguity. Isn't that awesome? I love that. Like, can you imagine how the last two months would have felt if you had already gained realizations of relaxing with paradox and ambiguity, which is what a lot of us have been feeling. And so there are physical things, the environment, roles and activities that we identify with, relationships, but a lot of the hardest thing for us to let go of is our concepts of ourselves. And sometimes the hardest thing that we have to let go of is the suffering that we create for ourselves. The great Vietnamese master Thich Nhat Hanh once said, the last thing that people will let go of is their suffering, right? Sometimes we use our suffering itself as a form of identity. And so looking at, are we even willing to let go of the story of suffering that we have about our lives? That can be one of the hardest things. So we'll look at that. I have a student who was recently sharing with me that she realized, she had a realization that she was constantly blaming external conditions for her lack of growth. Oh, if only she didn't have a family and this child with special needs, she could meditate more. If only, if only, if only. And then she realized she was using that as a way to stay small, right? As a way not to grow and progress. And then I started talking to her and I said, okay, your need to stay small, look deeper. What's the need underlying the need to stay small? And she said, oh, it's a need for belonging, so I won't be rejected. She said, my family always would kind of get threatened if I'd be too successful. So I'm limiting myself, blaming it on something on the outside. So that was a huge revelation for her. So I think I mentioned this example because sometimes 
when the first step is realizing something, especially a story or narrative about ourselves that we're hanging on to that may be limiting, because that's often the hardest thing to let go of, a way we can develop compassion for ourselves is to see, hey, there's an underlying need even underneath my story of suffering that I'm hanging on to. I was listening to a podcast, this amazing podcast the other day, and the, the teacher was saying, our three core needs are safety, belonging, and dignity. And she said, just about everything that we do can trace back to somehow trying to fulfill these three needs of safety, belonging, and dignity. And I just thought that was so profound. And to me, it's the kind of way we can have self-compassion even at, around our maybe dysfunctional tendencies of not letting go of our own suffering and pain. Okay, so that's, I just found that kind of mind-blowing to, to really think about at that very, very subtle level. So what I want to do now is guide you through a guided contemplation where we'll look at some of these things in our own life. The way to make these meditations the most impactful is to really try and apply them and make them as personal as possible. I'll guide you through. What I'm going to do is read out some prompts for you to think about, and then I'll pause. And during the pause, just think. If your mind wanders, which it probably will, just kind of try and remember the prompt when you notice that your mind is wandering. Then I'll kind of give you another prompt. And we'll go through the, like this for maybe 12 or 15 minutes. Then what I'd love to do is have us go into groups, maybe of three people for about 10 minutes to just talk about whatever it is that came up. And then we'll come back for a bigger group discussion or any questions or any reflections that you might have that you want to share with the bigger group. So that's the plan. So let's get in a in a posture that's comfortable for us for about 10 or 15 minutes of practice. So getting comfortable, if you'd like to turn off your video for this part of the session, that's fine to do as well. And taking a moment again to just Settle into your body and just check your body again to see if there's any tightness or tension or constriction and deliberately relaxing. And then just settling with the breath for a few moments to settle the mind. And as we do this practice, since we're in this place of this crisis, as I said, there might be some things that have been taken away from us, but we also may have had some time to think about our lives and we might wanna make some changes, reprioritize our lives, let go of certain things. So keep this in mind as we do this contemplation, there might be this might be a turning point in your life. You might be looking to make some change, so keeping that in mind as well. And so first think of letting go in terms of the physical world. Are there any possessions, material things, maybe where you're living, anything in the physical world that you might be ready to consider letting go of. Some people, as they get involved in a spiritual path, just naturally have a 
urge to simplify their lives. Is there some way you'd like to simplify physically in terms of possessions and things? And then thinking about your activities, are there any activities, things you're involved with that maybe no longer feel authentic for you? Examine what it would look like to perhaps release some of these activities. And then thinking about roles in your life. Are there any roles that you might feel finished with and be ready to move on? Maybe there's a role that you really identify with, but you might be ready to let that go. What might support you in letting go of these roles? What about relationships? Are there any relationships in your life that you feel have changed? Maybe it's not a question of letting go completely, but just changing the way that you're relating to some of the people in your life, or maybe just letting go altogether. Are there any relationships that you might consider moving towards letting go of? And now thinking of your self-identification, just your ideas about yourself. 
Are there aspects of your identity that you feel ready to let go of? Are you ready to move on? Might there even be aspects of your identity that are no longer even valid or accurate, but you're still kind of holding on to some idea about yourself, almost like a phantom limb that you might feel ready to examine and gently release? And then being very gentle with yourself, but investigating, is there any identification with your suffering or even a self-created suffering? Something created through a narrative or story about your life? Again, be very gentle if this is triggering. You can just go back to the breath or go back to another contemplation. But might you feel ready to let go? of even your suffering. And in this inquiry, you might realize that there's some things that you're not ready to let go of. What are some of these things that you're just not ready to let go? And gently Asking yourself, what needs are being met by not letting go? And who might you be if you did let go?
And in, in examining all of these areas and all of the ways in which you might be ready to move towards letting go, what would be most supportive of you in this journey? So what would really support that process for you? And then releasing the concepts, releasing the inquiry, and just taking a few moments to settle back in with the breath, just feeling whatever sensations might be alive in your body. Just relaxing with each out breath. Just taking a moment to come back to the space, gently come out of meditation. Okay, so the invitation now is to go into groups of three each and just share. We'll have about 10 minutes total, so a couple of minutes for each person to share whatever it might have been that came up for you in that meditation that you feel comfortable sharing. Again, as Eve was saying, we've got a couple of kind of ground rules for the breakout rooms that confidentiality within the group, so not sharing outside the group what anyone shared. Also, um, not giving advice, not problem solving, but just really listening empathetically to each other. If you, you have a right to pass, if you'd like not to share, or as Eve was saying, you know, if there's something very deep, maybe just share something else that came up for you. Anything else, Eve? Just, you know, that um, as San Francisco Dharma Collective, it's really um, one of the main values is to make a space that feels welcoming. Um, for all of our participants and that we really hold that um, to be just the most important experience and recognizing we just have no idea what someone else is coming here with and um, to really just be aware of our, our projections, our bias and, and try to show up as much as we can just as a listening presence. Great. So Katie, can you set us up? Great. So we'll see you back, and then when you come back, we'll just invite if anybody would like to um, share with the bigger group, we'll have some time for discussion and questions and answers and so forth. So see you in 10 minutes. You'll get, a, I think, a little reminder when you're getting close. So we will keep you, keep you in there. Enjoy your spiritual friends. <laughs> Yeah. Do you want to facilitate this part? Katie was saying that you read out feedback mm -hmm. from the chat. Is that right? Yeah. That ends up being a bit easier to manage. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'd be, you know, so if folks can 
get ready with their with their chat i would just be um cu curious to um oh katie you got props there for props. smooth breakouts good job wonderful um um, yeah, we might have lost a couple people. I know that in the Friday night sit, um, when the breakouts happen, um, almost 80 people leave every time. Um, and that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> um, so I think we only, we lost maybe 10 people, but that's, uh, that's, understand. that's understandable. It's, again, um, there is something very beautiful about receiving teachings and there's something very beautiful about connecting with one another and, and I get it. So, um, yes, it was really wonderful to be together and, and I'd be curious from folks, um, you know, if, if you'd be open to sharing in the chat, um, was there something that was interesting to you to hear from someone and to resonate to yourself, especially like what was, what did you hear um, that maybe made you think of something um, you hadn't thought of before. People are expressing appreciation for their small groups. Mm -hmm. So that's nice too. Yeah. I had uh, Arnie and Donna in my small group who were lovely to see. Um, they are of different eras of San Francisco Dharma Collective, so they hadn't even met, which was really nice for them to meet in this virtual setting. And um, I, I learned a lot from what Donna shared with me about um, learning how to really take responsibility for, for her own life, actually. Um, that was really moving. Mm. And, you know, letting go of an idea that, well, someone else will take care of it. <laughs> um there are some there will be another plan um yeah it was really um yeah meaningful to hear um i see here that um matthew is saying that he enjoyed that many of us are experiencing um this time together in similar ways so that reflection uh, and that we can let go of having things um, Jenny says that the opportunity was enjoyed just to connect in the small group. Um, <laughs> memory may not be required for happiness. <laughs> yes, Arnie was sharing with us about um, some of his realizations that he, he's been having there. Uh, and Noam says, letting go of letting go. Claudia says that she resonated with the need to let go of being the nice girl that we learn as kids for the sake of being approved of. The need for safety and belonging. Boy, I can resonate with that one. I used to be the nice girl <laughs> before I turned into the not nice nun. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, in our group, it also came up the, the roles that we create for ourselves and our family. Um, and, and I, I would definitely, I wonder what it would be like to still take care of those in my family, because that is mine to do, but without the role of being the caregiver. I thought I really loved that part of your meditation, Tenzin, where you asked us about the role. I mm. think it's very profound and not something I, I think about very often, um, of letting go of that specific aspect of our... Mm identity project mm, yeah um let's see here people dealing with the same issues not alone in their problem yeah says sammy um and walt says i exchanged my employment role for my retirement volunteer role so i mean still being in the working uh world i assume mm. Still getting um, there. I love what Katie says. We talked about how during the guided practices, the letting go got deeper and deeper. The resistance got stronger and stronger, right? Like the external things, because it went kind of from external to much more subtly internal. And that's harder. It's easier to get rid of the stuff. Mm. But especially, you know, that level of 
the suffering we're creating for ourselves as part of our identity. I would love to hear if anybody's brave enough to share anything about that that might have come up. Yeah. Yeah, the things we're not quite ready to let go and developing what need is being met by holding on to it. And for me, that's really where the self-compassion comes. It's like, no, it's, you know, we have these basic needs and we're getting them met even sometimes by behavior we label as dysfunctional or not, you know, in service to our thriving, but there's some need that's being met there. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and we do have time actually to, um, to hear from folks if they'd like to speak up since we're breaking all the rules this time, not that there are rules, but <laughs> we're shifting our format. We're evolving um, as a Sangha, which is nice. And don't worry for those of you who are like, this was excruciating. Being in a group is not how I want to spend every time. No problem. We uh, share that too. <laughs> we share that too. And, um, you know, we, we can go back and forth with this. Sometimes there could be that more, I'm home, I'm tired, I want to receive teachings. And then we can also play with this format, which, you know, as, um, Ten, I, I am 100% with Tenzin that, you know, a lot of this work is, is amplified by connecting with one another. It's so important. Um, and just, you know, I, I sometimes worry in that on the online platform, I can't see you all in the room. And so I don't know what's happening. So I have to say it's me being a little bit protective that has not wanted to um, do these smaller groups. But I am feeling that um, building our trust together is, has been really beautiful. So thank you all for confirming that um, and your participation. So Donna raised her hand. Can we unmute Donna? Hi. There she is. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for your teaching today, um, both of you. Um, uh, a thought about letting go. Um, last fall, um, I went on a six-week retreat at IMS and um, it was the first time I'd been on a, a long retreat uh, longer than 10 days um, and uh, so I was in silence for about six weeks um, it was probably I, and I wanted to go I, I felt like I really needed to go um, uh, because I was uh, really trying to get through um, the process of my divorce. Um, and uh, it was probably, uh, the way I describe it, is probably the most stressful and painful six weeks of my life. <laughs> I mean, I was really wound up, um, especially the first two weeks. Mm. Um, and what I figured out was that, um, that I was really identified somehow with the pain that I had. Mm -hmm. because it felt like that was the only thing I had left of the, this relationship that was mm -hmm. 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so I was really identified with um, the loss of it. Um, uh, and because the relationship was so formative, you know, it was like, where, where do I begin now? <laughs> um, and I, I recently heard something about like, how equanimity um, is kind of a last resort. <laughs> and I understand that phrase now because I felt like uh, I actually didn't have any choice about facing just like the brutal reality. Mm. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I had to, uh, I had to, let go and i ended up dropping a lot of baggage mm -hmm. serious just, mm -hmm. but it wasn't something that i could control like i really had to go through that all the way down to the bottom there was like <sighs> nothing left mm -hmm. um, and uh anyway i you know i mean it's my hope that letting go is not like that all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. That some things letting go is a little easier. Um, can you can you speak to 
maybe the different levels of letting go that one might experience. I mean, I certainly don't want to go through a process like that with everything that I need to let go of. Mm. Thank you for your r really vulnerable sharing about, you know, the relationship. I really appreciate you brought that up. And what I really noticed was when you said the pain was like your last connection to this person that you'd spent 25 years with. And like we were talking about what need is being met by even not letting go of your pain was still that connection. Like you had that need for connection to this person that you shared so much of your life with. And I think we can be very tender with ourselves when we realize, of course, you had that need to stay connected. And it was so painful that the only thing left was the pain. So I think that's kind of the answer. I think, you know, like I was saying, sometimes the more external things are easier. Somebody was saying they noticed this heat coming up in their body and the resistance, you know, as we went kind of more and more subtle. And it's sort of that nuance because of course we're trying to get ground under our feet. And I think the things that we feel give us the most ground are the things that are the harder to let go of. But in Buddhism, I think this is where I was talking to a friend of mine today about the practice of refuge that we have in Buddhism. And instead of taking refuge in external things, even taking refuge in our roles, even taking refuge in our limited identity, we're taking like the ultimate refuge is our own awakening. And I think that enables us to let go of the other things. The more we really shift our refuge to, my refuge is my Buddha nature and my ultimate potential for awakening, because everything else is transitory. Like that's the only thing I can really depend on. Mm. And for me, the more I get habituated to that, it's not like I'm there yet. But when, when I'm really struggling with letting go of something, I mean, all this impermanence that's been going on lately has really rattled me too. And there have been a lot of changes in the Buddhist center where I live and I'm shook, you know, but keep reminding myself, hey, I've still got my own virtuous qualities, my own Buddha nature, my practice. So it's actually really good for our refuge to have things get shaken up externally, right? So I think, I mean, that's, that's what it is for me. And Eve, I, I would love to hear what, you, what reflections you have on this. That's so beautiful, Tenzin. I, you know, I just think of, um, again, you know, this word that um, the, the teacher who I sit with, Jennifer Wellwood, uses a lot for letting go, which is yielding. Mm. Mm. And, and that reminds me of another Pema Chodron teaching of, she talks about getting a knack for space. Oh, nice. And you're really getting like familiar with opening up instead of closing down to whatever life is offering you. Um, and with that attitude of, okay, hey, welcome, come on in, right? And, and that, not that it's easy, but that there's, um, you know, the other way of letting go is, is letting in. Mm. Right. Um, yes. so, and that's exactly who I identified Donna was like, I just didn't want, didn't want it. I was holding it back. And other people mentioned resistance. So getting a knack for space or getting a knack for that mm. kind of openness feels really meaningful. And everything I think that we can let go of allows for something new to come in, you know, and allows for our own transformation because I've often thought about my own spiritual life and a question kind of like a Zen koan I'm always asking myself is, okay, what's holding me back? Mm. And usually I'm creating whatever it is that's holding me back. It's never anything imposed on me or external or some opportunity. You know, it's always my attachment to staying small somehow to get some need met. So that's kind of always the answer for me is, wow, it's me. Mm. But if I just let go, then I can become some, you know, I can grow and become much bigger. So, and I have to be ready to do that. It's kind of like Mingyur Rimshay getting ready to change out of his robes. 
he thought about it, he considered it, he worked his self up to it because I think we're so good at beating ourselves up like we use our spiritual path as yet another <laughs> way to beat ourselves up for not being perfect enough or something and I think that attitude of gentleness is something we can really learn from it's just like that's why I use language like I invite you to consider maybe thinking about letting go <laughs> you know I mean that's how we begin yeah can I add um, that one of the things that I figured out was, or I just learned from that process, was that um, my thoughts were being harmful to myself. Mm -hmm. My thoughts were harmful to myself. And that um, I started noticing that um, my mind was following the groove of these negative thoughts. And so then I started... <coughs> trying to turn away from that groove, you know, move it over. Um, and uh, it, it started with having a body awareness of how my mind was going. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I could feel that, that thing starting to tense up. And then it's like, oh yeah, I'm doing that thing again. I have thought this thing a thousand times already. It's never been resolved when I do it this way. Um, so that's how I got, that's how I let go because I could see that it was, it was just a habit. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that, that you named. And sometimes, you know, when even I teach cultivating emotional balance and we talk about, you know, destructive emotional habits really, and they're just these grooves that our mind just kind of goes down this groove. So the first step and sometimes 99% of the solution is just noticing it, just being aware of it. You know, this default mode that our mind, it was like, oh, wow, I'm doing it again. And then sometimes even just that awareness is enough to unravel it. So it's really powerful, just that noticing, which is what our good old fashioned mindfulness practice is all about, like catching it and, uh, you know, feeling it in the body, catching it when it comes up, those, those typical habits. Thank you for sharing, Donna. Appreciate it. That reminds me, Venerable, we should let folks know about what exciting thing is going on this weekend. Even I have an exciting plan for this weekend, <laughs> and you're all welcome to join us. We're going to talk about anger for three hours on Saturday. Doesn't that sound like fun? And it's being sponsored by Land of Medicine Buddha, which is where I live and teach. And if you just Google Land of Medicine Buddha and go on the website, you too can join us yet again. <laughs> we, we taught way back, you know, 100 years ago, the first weekend of February, we taught at Land of Medicine Buddha in person for a day long on an introduction to cultivating emotional balance. And the 55 or so people in the room were clamoring for more. So we had decided to do yet another day long on May 30th, long ago. But I just can't bear asking people to sit in front of Zoom for a day long. So we had to cut it down to three hours because that's about the maximum that any of us can bear. Oh, and somebody's just put the link, some wonderful person <laughs> put the link up. Great. Thank you, Diane Solomon, for being the <laughs> publicity support. So we're excited about that. Eve and I always have tons of fun when we teach together. So hoping anybody who likes can join us. Yeah. That embodied awareness is... Um such an important part of working with our, our habit of frustration and anger. So, um, yeah, I, I just want to um, really appreciate all of you for showing up and connecting with each other and really um, engaging in these teachings that are incredibly challenging and can make us feel a bit um, daunted by how much more there is to do. How much more? And, you know, I love this invitation of bit by bit, right? Maybe we even have an idea of what it could look like. And then maybe we try it on or play with it. And um, I think it's really meaningful. One of the things that Sogni Rinpoche suggests in our last chapter that we read last week was 
once a day, invite yourself to kind of, it's like taking off the cloak of all of your identities and just feel that sense of mere I, of simple I, of just, this is my body in sensation. This is what I can hear. And just allowing yourself that simplicity of being. So you can practice letting go even just once a day and letting go of these identity structures and feeling into a sense of just beingness. So I'll invite us to come together and do that for one minute before we dedicate our merit. So just no need even for a formal posture, wherever you are, see if you can just release as though you were taking off a heavy coat after coming in from a storm. And you no longer need that defense. And you can just slip into the experience of being a body, being a heart, being a mind, which has such transparency that everything can come and go. Just keep on dropping into this simple experience of feeling the body through the entire field of tactile sensation. Noticing whatever can be heard or experienced through our sense portals lightly, no preference, no judgment. And just one or two more breaths here, completely yielding and surrendering everything that needs to get done, everything that wasn't done already. And finding, hopefully, in this space of our most simple form of being, that there's already a sense of warmth, already a sense of basic okayness or goodness. And from that shared sense of goodness and okayness, naturally what arises is our desire that all of us could be connected and that we could be in support and in service that all beings would know their true nature that all beings would be free from painful and difficult delusions and projections, self-criticisms and that all beings would be at peace. And let's dedicate the connection and learning we've done here together in the hope and aspiration that that may be so. Beautiful to be with you all. Next week, Chandra will be back. Uh, she's had this month to do writing and um, she's been missing you all. So Chandra Easton will be back next week. We'll continue on the book. And I bet there's some announcements from Mason Pamela. Hi everyone. I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about just this contribution idea. Um, of course, it's about the hope that we can encourage you to give financial contribution um, to the Dharma Collective, which will also be 
contributed to our excellent teachers who come together with us, contributing their time and energy and collecting their wise thoughts and their vulnerabilities to bring here. Um, and then, so if you guys can contribute in that financial way, that is so supportive and awesome because that, that is a way of giving back. Um, and then all the other ways that we contribute to the Sangha uh, in, in such a way that Eve was able to maybe find some ground in a place tonight through the inspiration maybe of Tenzin, but also the inspiration of how these weeks now we've been contributing our presence and our own um, wholesome engagement to feel comfortable about maybe taking this risk of the breakout rooms um, and then showing up together there, you know, and contributing our attentive or whatever kind of listening that we had going on. Um, and I mean, I know for me, that was really, really very nice. Um, so just to offer this idea of contribution um, and, and appreciation for the contributions that you have made and just the comment that the monetary contribution is definitely valued in our um, capitalist system and, and <laughs> supports us in ways that are innumerable when we give it in these kinds of situations. So thank you so much, everyone. And I just want to mention that there's in the chat box ways to donate. And then just, I think many of you know this, but the Dharma Collective calendar is bursting full, including morning sits that are hosted by people who are all over the place and attended by people. And Michael Owens is teaching Friday night and he's just like crazy banana, smart, fierce, knows so much about Buddhism as a scholar and um, connoisseur and teacher. And <laughs> just check out the calendar. People are working hard to make a really cool calendar happen. For mm -hmm. Thank you to the volunteers. For those of you who don't know, San Francisco Dharma Collective is a volunteer-run Dharma Center. So amazing. So amazing. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. So you can unmute and say goodbye, farewell.